I'd like for you to take the Word of God this morning and open it, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As I began studying for this message on the mind of Christ, uh, I re- recalled to mind something that happened years and years ago when my wife and I were youth leaders over at, uh, it was just recently ceased being Maplewood Baptist Church, it was Stowe Baptist Church, and we met with the young people down in the basement, and uh, the Lord was blessing, and we were outgrowing our Sunday school room, which was a, a real blessing, and this one young man came in, and he had on an LED belt buckle, it was an LED scrolling text on his belt buckle. And do you remember what it said? It was, it was some popular song lyric at the time. And it was scrolling across his belt buckle as he came in. And I said, well, that's neat. Where'd you get that? And he didn't know it was a gift. I said, oh, that's really something. And we talked about it for a little bit. And uh, I preached about or taught about in Sunday school that day about the scriptures how we ought to apply it, how we ought to study it, meditate on it, memorize it, those kinds of things, how we ought to be committed to the Scripture because it is the Word of God. And as he was leaving from class, he had changed the text, and I don't know how he did it. There's some He knew how, you know. But the text said, the Word of God, and it kept scrolling across, the Word of God, the Word of God. And I thought that was cute. It kind of tickled me, but it set me to thinking, Could you imagine if you had some sort of uh, messaging system that broadcast your thoughts all the time? That would be awful, wouldn't it? (laughs) We all have filters that we put on our mouths to keep us from saying things that we uh, recognize are probably not the best things to say. Could you imagine if just at all times your mind were, were given out? It's not. We get to choose what things we think to verbalize and what things to hide. Because of that, a lot of times we are duplicitous. We say things that we don't believe. We say something that we don't mean. There's some hidden meaning in our words or there's some truth that's been left unspoken. Have you ever been listening to someone speak to you and you've thought, I don't believe this person? I think they're lying. Maybe it was a child who had chocolate on their lips who says, I didn't touch, you know, the the chocolate candy. And you say, I don't believe you. There are three great things that God has given to us for human knowledge, three great sources. And if you're taking notes, I want you to jot these down because the Apostle Paul addresses these in 1 Corinthians 2 today. They are seeing, hearing, and thinking. We're often told that we have five senses, and when it comes to a certain manner of speaking, that's true. We do have five senses. I don't want to say five physical senses, because we have many, many senses. We have the ability to think, to understand, to discern And when someone is speaking with you, you hear them. But you also look at them. You also use your reasoning and you use your memory to call things to mind. If someone's talking to you and you doubt that what they're telling you is true, maybe you're going back in your history with them and saying, but you said such and such before. And we use these great sources for knowledge, our minds, our ears, and our eyes in order to discern what we think is true and what we think is false. And when we get all of our ducks in a row, we can say, well, I think this is true and I think this is false. And we use these great sources for human knowledge. But Paul tells us in the first verse of our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16, that those three great sources of human knowledge all break down when it comes to knowing the mind of God. Those things are insufficient for knowing the mind of God. So how can we know the mind of God? Does he have a giant LED belt buckle that will tell us what he's thinking? Uh, 
No, he's given us something so much better. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. And he's given us his body, his church. And Paul addresses these things. Where the breakdown, where my human ability is insufficient to know God, he has bridged the gap. And we ought to learn to to depend on the things that God has given to us. Let's read together. You can read silently while I read aloud. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, our text is verses 9 through 16. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we come to you humbly requesting that your presence would be with us, that you would teach us, that you would meet with us by your Spirit, that you would educate us, that you would open our eyes to reveal the light and the truth of your Word. And Lord, we depend upon you. We claim your promises. If we would ask, if we would seek, if we would knock, we would find, we would receive, the door would be open to us. And so we ask this morning, Father, that you would fill us with your Spirit, that you would reveal yourself and your Son in the Word, that you would impress upon our hearts the truth of what we read. Father, we request humbly your help, and we claim your promise, believing that what you have said is true, and we depend upon it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a main theme in our text. As you know, it's the goal of the Apostle Paul to bring the church into unity of speech and understanding so that they can avoid unnecessary divisions. You'll remember from chapter 1 that this church in Corinth was divided over preferred teachers. I like Paul, I like Apollos, I like Peter, that type of thing. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring them into order and into maturity. Where there's unnecessary strife and conflict, it's generally because there is immaturity. Where there's maturity, there's going to be necessary strife and necessary conflict. We'll know what types of fights need picking and what types of fights need fighting. But where there's immaturity, uh, let's just be honest, children fight over things that really don't matter and sometimes adults do too but it's a maturity issue and look in chapter 3 verse 1 the apostle paul is trying to bring them to a place of maturity spiritual maturity he said i have to talk to you like your babies in christ i have to feed you with milk we can't have steak out on the grill i need to fill the bottle and feed you that way because you're still infantile in your faith And this is the issue with the church at Corinth. They're not growing properly. 
there's some disorder within them that has stunted their spiritual growth. Now, they've come to Christ by faith. They're believers, they're Christians, but they are not all they could be. And therefore, they're not all they should be. I guess if we would ask here, how many of us are what we, don't raise your hand, but if I were to ask, how many of us are what we could be for Jesus? There wouldn't be many hands raised. How many of us could be more for, well, we'd all put our hands up. And if you could be more for Jesus, the truth is you should be. There has to be growth and we ought to be seeking it and pursuing it. Chapter 2 is where Paul is correcting their, their disorders here. He's showing them that they all came to Christ the same way. None of them are better than the other. None of them are higher than the other. Your preferences and your opinions really matter little because it is Christ's work in the world and the Spirit's continuing work in the church and the church's continuing work in your life that has brought you to faith in Jesus Christ. So who do you think you are? to criticize your brother, to set your preferences up, those types of things. And Paul says, and we've gone through verses 1 through 8, but he comes to verse 9, and he says, these things of Christ and Him crucified and, and His work on the cross, we didn't see that with our eyes. We didn't hear that with our ears. We did not naturally discern them. If it were not for God working to reveal Himself, Jesus Christ would just be another victim of Roman cruelty. And you would probably not even know about it. If it were not for the Spirit that was given to the church at Pentecost, that empowered the apostles, that carried on the work all the way to our day, Jesus would just be more ink on the pages of history. But, verse 13... We have the mind of Christ. So this trip from verse 9, you didn't see this with your eyes. You didn't hear this with your ears. It didn't enter into your heart. You didn't come up with this. You didn't sort this out. You didn't figure this out. All the way to verse 16, but we have it. We have it. You didn't do it. You didn't work it out. You didn't figure out this great salvation scheme, but you have it. Well, how does, this, how does this work? Well, that's what the point of the message will be to help us to sort out what Paul's saying. Uh, I have three points. I'll give them to you here real quickly. Number one, the first, it's really simple, the things. The things. If you're taking notes, you can write those two words down. Point one, the things. I notice the word things is used several times in this passage. Firstly, in verse 9, Paul, the apostle, talks about prepared things. And what things has God prepared for his people? And I think usually our minds go right to heaven and our eternal rewards. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. And so a lot of times people will lift this text kind of out of where it is and 1 Corinthians and say, well, this is a text about heaven. But in the context, that's really not what he's talking about. He's talking about the salvation work of God, the work of God in the world to secure salvation for sinners. Worldly wisdom cannot discern the things God has prepared from before the foundation of the world. God's plan is immutable. God's plan is unstoppable. God's plan is unchangeable. God prepared the gospel plan from eternity past, as we saw in the last lesson. When God made the world, it was with a mind to the cross, redeemed sinners, and the glory of God. When God made the world, it was with a mind that He would redeem sinners by His own power and receive glory through their redemption. And Paul's saying, none of us sussed that out, right? None of us sorted through all the data and all of the historical figures and, and said, oh, God is working here. 
These are things he prepared for us by his spirit, which brings us to the second thing in verse 10, where Paul mentions the deep things of God. These things are not just prepared things, they're deep things. They're profound things. We're not talking about deep as in hidden. The word speaks means profundity. There are profound truths revealed in the scripture relating to God's work among men by his son and his spirit and his body in this age. There's no LED belt buckle that shows us the mind of, the God, of God, but the spirit of God has access to the mind of God. Have you ever been misrepresented? And someone says, yeah, well, so and so they said such and such because they didn't want to or they did. And they and somebody. In inserts motives, you know, puts a motive on you that doesn't belong on you. And you say, hey, give me a minute. Let me speak for myself. Right. Let me speak for myself. Nobody knows what's going on in your heart, but you. And who knows what's going on in the mind and heart of God? God. And it's His Spirit who shares these things. It's the Spirit of God who reveals these things. In verse 10, the word searcheth means to look into, to peer into. And the Holy Spirit, being a member of the Trinity, of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit being a full person, God in person has access to all of the divine knowledge. All of the divine knowledge is possessed by, it's accessible by, it belongs to, it is the spirits. How does that help us? Well, the Apostle Peter said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has revealed himself through the scripture. You know, this second chapter of 1 Corinthians has more to say about the Holy Spirit than any other chapter in the scripture. And it's not the gifts. It's the revelation. The greatest miracle is that God has revealed himself to us by his spirit. The profound, deep, meaningful, life-changing truths of scripture were given to us by men who were moved by the Holy Ghost. Verse 10 leans into what we call the imago dei, which is that we're image bearers. We bear, or we're people made in the image of God. And just as God is a spirit, you are a spirit. And just as no person can know your truest and deepest thoughts, so no person knows God's truest and deepest thoughts as God. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the Lord says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Do we believe God is capable of knowing his own mind? Is God capable of knowing his own mind? If he is, then we ought to let him speak for himself as often as is possible. And if you remember from the last lesson, if we gave God a chance to speak, he would come to earth and bear our sin in his body on the cross. And that's exactly what he did. That's why when Paul had a chance to speak for God, he preached nothing but Christ and him crucified. So we see the prepared things, verse 9, the deep things of God, verse 10. In verse uh, 12, we see thirdly, they are things freely given to us of God. Freely given to us. He didn't require anything before he revealed himself to us. He doesn't require that we join a church or give money or, or do any work for him. It's a free gift. His son came freely without charge. The word has been given freely without charge. The spirit has been given freely without charge. God requires nothing God requires nothing. He reveals himself freely. And that's grace. The Bible is one dimension of God's revelation. But notice in verse 12, the we. We. 
have received. And you saw earlier in the text how he changes from I to we. And the difference between we and them, those who are in the faith and those who are not. And he's saying we have received. The word received means um, to receive. That's pretty deep, isn't it? It's lambano, and usually it means take. That wouldn't make sense here if it were in the active sense, but it's, it's passive. We've been given. Lambano stops being a take, and it becomes a receive. It was given to us. And Paul says, we, those who are in the faith, have been given something. Notice how he says it in verse 12. We have received the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Freely given. We've received. We didn't take them. We didn't reach out and and wrestle with God as Jacob did. No, this has been given to us. And he indicates that our understanding Our ability to comprehend the things of God are the work of the Spirit. Now, we have to understand, and we're going to get to this, the Spirit works through His people. When you heard the Gospel, it wasn't from the Holy Spirit whispering to you in a vision or in a dream. When you heard the Gospel, it was another person. It was someone who knew the Lord, who said, here is what... God says about himself, the spirit works, the church works, the spirit and the bride say come. But Paul says these things are freely given to us of God. It's of grace. Fourthly, they're spoken and taught things. Notice verse 13, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And you notice, we speak and the Holy Spirit teaches. We teach. He teaches. There's a a unity in the work. There's an agreement in the work. When you come to the book of the Revelation, towards the end of all things, the Lord Jesus reminds us the Spirit and the bride say, come, let whosoever will come and drink of the water of life freely, freely given. But they're spoken by humans, but not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You might hear someone pray here, Lord Give the speaker, give the preacher the words to say. Why do we talk that way? Why do we use those kinds? Of, and maybe you've done that. Maybe you've been going to talk to someone and you've got to confront them about their sin. Or maybe you want to talk to them about the gospel and you want to reveal Christ. And you pray and you say, Lord, give me the words to say. Why do you, why do you talk that way? Why do you pray that way? Because these are spiritual words The Spirit, not the words that man's wisdom gives, not the words that educators tell us are the ones we ought to use. This is the way you ought to speak. No, God's people rely on the Spirit. We open our mouths and we let God fill our words. doesn't mean we don't study. What it means is that we recognize the things of God are prepared. They're deep and profound. They're unknowable outside the work of the Spirit. And so we have to rely on the work of the Spirit among us as we study the Word. So the first point is simply the things. The second point is this, the ministry. And verse 13 hints that we are co-laborers together with God. When I talk about the ministry, I'm talking about the ministry of the Spirit through the church. The ministry of the Spirit and the Word. He teaches and we teach. 
And you notice the Apostle Paul says in verse 13, which things also we speak. And I, I want to keep emphasizing that we because he's addressing the church here. And he's saying it's not just the apostle's job to speak. It's not just the apostle's job to teach. It is the church's job to edify itself in love. We must all be truth speakers. Every member of Emmanuel Baptist Church ought to be a truth speaker. You ought to speak truth. And you ought to depend on the Holy Spirit to help you to speak truth. Now, there is only one pastor who is ordained. There are set men who would be elders. There are wise men who must judge the truth that's taught from the pulpit. But there's only one truth. And we must all speak that truth to our neighbors. We speak the Holy Ghost teaches. We compare the things of the Spirit with the things of the Spirit. We go here a little, we go there a little. We, we go to the law and to the prophets. We go to the testimony of God to find the truth. We are confident that God has spoken. We are confident that the Word of God is reliable. What God has said is true. And it's up to us to believe it, to depend upon the Spirit to help us rightly discern it. God wants to be known. And this is how He's chosen to reveal Himself, through the Word preached by the power of His Spirit. Now, verses 12, 13, and 14 are amazing verses. The Apostle Paul gives six verbs in verses 12, 13 and 14 that teach us how the word is to be taught and how it is to be heard, how it's to be given and how it's to be received. And I want to reemphasize we ought to all be giving out the word. A well-ordered church consists of a pastor and people who all speak the truth. And the reverse is true. We ought to all be rightly receiving the truth. A well-ordered church consists of a pastor and of people who all receive the truth properly. Could you imagine being under a pastor who wants to teach the Word of God, but is never in the mood to receive it? What would that become? What would that be like? And then could you imagine being in a church where the congregation only wants to ever receive the word, but never wants to share it? You see, these are duties for all of us. It is in your best interest and mine that every one of us knows how to receive the word properly and teach the word properly. So let me give you three things regarding teachers. The word of God must be known, spoken, and taught. It must be known, spoken, and taught. We've been given the word of the Spirit of God so we might know the things He has freely given us. This knowing is beyond an academic knowledge. Academic knowledge is insufficient. It's not enough for us to know God. The Holy Spirit must enable us in our knowing. There are people who know more than me about the Scripture who don't know God. There are people who know more about the Scripture than you, but they don't know God. The goal of the Scriptures is not to gain academic knowledge so we can be puffed up and lorded over people. The goal of the Scriptures is that we might know Him. Well, there must be a knowing. And the Spirit of God, Paul says, is the one who's present to open our eyes. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak. And the Word of God must be spoken with boldness. And then he says, not in the words which the man which man's wisdom teacheth 
but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So there is a speaking and there is a teaching. There is a knowing, a speaking, and a teaching. So the word must be proclaimed with boldness, but it also must be explained with clarity. Have you ever heard someone who it, they speak boldly, but it's not very clear? Maybe they have boldness and energy and zeal, but you say, well, I'm not. I mean, I, I, I know he was excited, but I'm not exactly sure what he was saying. Mark Twain went to a church service one time. And he went home afterwards and his wife said, how was the service? He said, it was okay. She said, what did he speak on? And I don't even know if he went. He may have just been telling a joke, but this is a funny story. He said, um, he said he preached on sin. And his wife said, what did he say about it? And Mark Twain said, I think he was against it. Now listen, if you go to a Christian church and you have to wonder, was he against sin or for it? I think he was, um, you know, that type of thing. There must be clarity. Words must be used that may not be in the Bible to help us understand what the words in the Bible mean. And there must be a conviction. There must be a boldness. If you're going to teach the Word of God to someone, you must know that it's true so that you can speak it with boldness. But you also must understand it so that you can explain it with clarity. Uh, I've had to just say before, well, you know, if you read the book I read, you would understand it. And the point is, I couldn't really explain it. I couldn't really use my words to explain something that I believed. But this is one of the reasons we spend so much time preparing our sermons. Samuel's going to be preaching, Lord willing, from Hosea this afternoon, and I'm excited to hear that. I've sat with him through much of his preparation, and he said, Three weeks of study, of reading the the text and praying. He said, and finally, was it Monday the Lord gave you light? Monday. It opened up. He said, I understand it. And he began to write his notes. That's thrilling to me. That has to happen. Our preparation for whenever we go to teach the Word of God, whether it's a sermon or a phone call to a son or a daughter, to a spouse, to a loved one, to a neighbor or a co-worker, whenever we go to speak the Word of God, all of our preparation must begin with and be saturated with a cry to the Holy Spirit. Help me to know these things, to believe them, to speak them with boldness, and to understand them so that I can teach them with clarity. We must depend on on the Spirit of God for help in our truth speaking. We cannot know the truth without God. Let me try that again. We cannot know the truth without God. We cannot speak it properly without the presence of God. We cannot teach it properly without the presence of the Spirit of God. Our work in this world depends on God's Spirit being with us and being present and helping us, enabling us, empowering us. Three things regarding teachers. The Word of God must be known, spoken, and taught. The three things regarding hearers is that hearers must receive, understand, and appreciate the message that is given. Those are my words. The words that we're looking at are in verse 14. Receive, know, and discern. When the message of God is given, when the message of God's love and salvation, of His presence, His truthfulness, His love, when it's given and it seems to fall on deaf ears, what happened? Where's the breakdown? So often we kick ourselves and we say, boy, if I'd have just said this, if I'd have just had this thought, if I'd have said the right way, and we ought to depend on the Spirit. But often the souls we're speaking to have not been enabled to receive, understand, and appreciate the message. You say, well, then we shouldn't talk to them. No, we should. Because faith comes by what? By hearing, and hearing by what? By the word of God, we sow and we water and we we pray for God to give the increase. We work and he works. We are laborers together with God. 
Do you believe the message of Jesus? I'll ask our little children, and, and not all of them are here today, but I'll ask the little children, do you believe the message of Jesus? Do you believe the message of Jesus? Do you? Do you believe that Jesus loved you? That he died on the cross? That he was buried? That he rose again? Do you know why? Because he loves us. But do you know why you understand that? It's because the Holy Spirit came to you and let you know it was true. Have you ever had your mother come in and maybe sit on your bed at nighttime and you're half asleep and she says, I love you. Do you believe her? Have you ever had your daddy come in after work and give you a big hug and say, I love you. Do you believe him? So one of the blessings about children is that when they hear a father or mother speaking, I believe that. And when the Heavenly Father comes by His Spirit and says, this is true, there's a tenderness that says, I believe that. Some of us here have been damaged by the world and we've become cynical and it's harder to believe. Sometimes we sin and we look at our sin and it's harder to believe when the Holy Spirit reaffirms, yes, you're loved. Yes, you are forgiven. Yes, you are a child of God. And then is when we should pray Psalm 119 verse 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We must depend on the Spirit to know the things that are freely given to us of God. We must depend on Him. We must seek His help. We must crave His help. Those who have not been helped by the Holy Spirit, Paul says they're in their natural state. And he goes so far in verse 14 to say they cannot know them. The things of God are foolishness to them. Tell to someone in their natural condition, God sent His Son to die for you. Your sin has separated you from God, but God in love has bridged the gap. He sent His Son. He sent His Spirit. He gave His Word. He's short, he shared His heart with us. And they say, yeah, it's foolishness. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that some guy could die on a cross 2,000 years ago and it would mean anything to me today. It's foolishness. Now what's going to change that? What will alter that? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit of God. We've been given the Spirit of God. That we might know these things. That we might understand them. And then that we might appreciate them. We discern them. We say, this is true. This is true. I believe that this message is true. Do you remember when you heard the gospel? And you said, I believe this is true. That God in love sent his son to die on the cross. I believe this is true. You may not know it yet, but the Spirit of God was present, helping you, teaching you, opening your eyes. God's good to us. And that's where the Spirit works. You know, so often we look at meetings today, we look where there's a lot of excitement and a lot of hubbub, and we say, boy, God's Spirit really moved. Usually after we have meetings, the questions are, was the singing loud? Did the people shout amen at the top of their lungs? Did people, now, it, maybe you haven't been down south, but folks will run around during church service. They run up and down the aisle. Was there loud praying and lots of tears? Was the altar full at the end of the service? And if the answer is yes, then we'll say, well, the Spirit of God really moved tonight. The Spirit of God was present. But I want to cut through that and just say that's silliness. 
All of that can be fabricated. All of that can be faked. Every bit of it. Sometimes it can be sincere and worthless. Esau seeking a place of repentance with tears and finding none. What benefit is this if it does not draw us closer to God? What benefit is any of it if it doesn't bring us into the presence of God? It's worthless. Here is something that cannot be faked. And I want you to write this phrase down because I think it's an explanation of what Paul's sharing with us here. The cycle of Christian teaching that produces true Christian maturity. If you want to write down the full bit, it would be the cycle of spirit empowered Christian teaching that produces true Christian maturity. And here's what that is. It's when someone hears the word of God given by the power of the Spirit and by the presence of the Spirit, they say, that's true. I believe that. I believe that. The soul is awakened. The eyes are opened. All things are become new. That person becomes a new creature because of the preaching of the gospel. They say, I believe that. It's true. And then the whole world turns against them and they go on saying, I still believe it. It's still true. Even when everything turns against them, they go on believing. And then they meet someone else and they tell them, have you heard this? This is what I believe. This is what I think is true. And they show from the scripture. And that person says, oh, I believe that. That's true. And then the whole world turns against them and they go on believing it. They go on believing that it's true. It makes a difference. A real difference. Not a quick flash in the pan, sort of emotional type decision. But a changed person. A new creature. Made new. The cycle of Christian teaching that results in mature Christian disciples cannot be fabricated. I'm going to say this now and we'll get back to it. But the result is the person not only hears the message, they not only believe that it's true, but they begin to love God. They go from hating God, being an enemy of God, living in rebellion and disobedience to God. They go from that to saying, I love God. His laws are good. His government is pure. His word is true. I commit myself to him. I love him. He is God. He is my God. He's my love. He's my savior. He's my friend. What happened? This is the blessing of the spirit of God. Among us. I'm going to say this very um, plainly because I think it's true. Without the presence of God's Spirit, we would be helpless. We would be helpless. Could you stand against your adversary, the devil, without the help of the Spirit of God? Could you withstand the onslaught of the world against your faith without the help of the Spirit of God? Cannot. Cannot. The Spirit of God must be present and active. Without the Spirit of God, this is an absolute impossibility. This cycle that Paul is sharing with the church, this is what happened to me, this is what happened to you. We receive the Spirit of God. We have received the truth of God. We now share the truth of God. The church builds itself in love around the truth through the power of the Spirit. It could not happen. Verse 14, it cannot happen without the presence of the Holy Spirit. In church, we must learn to depend on the Spirit. We must learn to depend on the Spirit because if we don't, we are functioning in the power of our own flesh. And we're helpless. We're helpless. Notice those who are spiritual, this is verse 15, 
those who are spiritual, those are those who've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. They've been able to discern the things freely given to us of God. They can understand all things that God has said. The word behind judge in, in verse 15, it's used twice in verse 15. It's the same Greek word. It's used in verse 14 and translated as discern, which is a fine, um, fine translation all of these uh, understandings within the word, but there is this understanding that what Paul's saying, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. It's the same idea. Yet he himself is judged of no man. So, whereas those who are unconverted can know nothing of the Spirit of God, the church that is filled with genuinely saved people. I want you to get this. This is any church. Any church that is filled with genuinely saved people have access to the mind of Christ by the power of the Spirit. This is what Paul's teaching us. We have the mind of Christ. It is in the church where this is played out. Men and women who are enabled by the Spirit to teach and receive the deep things of God grow together into a selfless, cross-bearing, loving fellowship. It is only in the Christian church where this is played out. Men and women together, enabled by the Spirit, teaching and receiving the things of the Spirit of God are enabled to know the mind of Christ. So, here comes an issue in your life, in my life, in the life of the church. What do we do? How do we access the mind of Christ? Paul says, we have been given these things freely by the Spirit to know them, to understand them, to discern them, and to teach them. Look around in this room. Somebody in this room will be given the answer by the Spirit of God. Someone in this room will teach you from the book, by the power of the Spirit, how you should operate, how you should live. According to the Apostle, you notice in verse 15, he that is spiritual. Spiritual people are those who gather together. Get this. Spiritual people are those who gather together around the word of God, enabled by the spirit of God to discover the mind of God towards them to build up the church of God in love. And when Paul gets to chapter 3, he says, and it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to grow up. And we'll get to this, Lord willing, next week. You say, it's time to be spiritual, though. Your life is not about you. You're not a, a Christian Rambo. I want to take care of everything myself. No, without God, where would you be? And God humbles us to say, I need God. And then he humbles us more to say, I need my Christian brothers and sisters who have the same spirit that I have to help me, to teach me. God works this way. There's a popular idea in, in our society to say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And I have to say that really misses the mark of what God says a spiritual person is. A spiritual person is someone who gathers with others around the Word of God, enabled by the Spirit of God to discover the mind of God towards them so that they can build up the church of God in love. So I'm going to back up just a little bit, understanding that that's what Paul is teaching us here. We have to understand this. Unless I am gathering together around the Word of God, enabled by the Spirit of God, to seek in the Word of God, to know the mind of God towards the church of God, I cannot claim that I am a spiritual person. I am not a spiritual person. I might climb the mountain and speak to the yogi and the 
the Dalai Lama and whatever else, Boo Boo and Yogi, I don't know who was up there, but I may do all of those exercises. But in the mind of God, that's mere religion, false religion, not true religion. He that is spiritual does this. Teaching and receiving, receiving and teaching the Word of God enabled by the Spirit of God. That is what makes a person spiritual, according to the definition of the Lord. So what does this mean to us? Well, I only have one third point, and we're going to go back for it. The third point is this, the key. And by that, I mean the key to Christian maturity. And if we aren't careful, we'll miss it. In fact, we may have missed it the whole message, so we're going to go back and tread carefully. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Look at this verse. The key to Christian maturity is this. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And that's so easy to just gloss over as we run through, but did you catch it? Our eyes cannot see, our ears cannot hear, it's never come into our minds the things which he has prepared for a certain people. For who? For them that love him. We've got to understand that God ties our love for him in with our love for each other. We cannot say, I love God if I do not love his people. I cannot say that I love God if I'm not living in obedience to what he has commanded for how I should be around his people. You know, the New Testament says the church is the bride of Christ. And if you came to me and said, boy, Matt, I really like you. I appreciate you. You're a good guy, but your wife is messed up. Man, I don't like her. She has so many problems. She has so many troubles. She has so many issues. I would say, you don't know either of us because you're describing me. You have us flipped. But people do that to Christ. I love God, but boy, don't, don't, don't talk to me about church. Man, they're messed up over there. They're screwed up. You know how they hurt me? You know how they messed me up? Do you think God takes kindly to people talking about his wife that way? Do you? And so what people do is they remove themselves from the bride. They say, well, I'd rather not be part of the bride. I would rather have a different connection to God than the connection that he has provided for me. I really think Paul's letting us know that that does not show a true love for God. I'm not saying a person is not saved, but it's certainly an immature reaction. It's certainly a childish reaction. If anyone knew the imperfections of the Christian church, it was Christ, and yet he died for her. Died for her. Paul certainly knew the imperfections, and he said, but still we gather, still we speak, still we receive, still we grow, still we work, but we do it together. We do it together. I want to emphasize not just the love, but look at what he says. Those that love him. Him. And what are your thoughts towards God? The God who planned a way to escape the, the, from sin. The God who came in the flesh to defeat our own enemies by his own power. The God who's spoken to us through his scriptures. The God who sent his spirit to teach us and be near us and enable us and empower us and draw us together and help us to build one another up. What do you think of him? Do you love him? Do you love him? Amen. Or have you been distracted by some other love? Some other lover has won your heart and won your attention. David Pryor puts it beautifully like this, quote, for the Corinthians, knowledge mattered more than love. For Paul, the key to knowing all that God has prepared for us is in loving him. 
Apparently, the quotation contained in verse 9 came to be a watchword of the Gnostics in later years as they laid claim to superior knowledge and standing before God. Paul is making it clear that such wisdom is open to all. And the way into this wisdom is to love God. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, If one loves God, one is known by Him. We must beware any tendency to sit back on our haunches and to feel like we have arrived. We must determine to love God with every fiber of our being. We must link closely with our fellow believers in the body of Christ because to have the mind of Christ is essentially a corporate experience. We have the mind of Christ. As we pursue these priorities, the Spirit will unfold to us more and more of the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. End quote. And to that I say, Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? And I wonder if you love the Lord. It's so easy to be sidetracked by other loves. The greatest the greatest struggle of every life, I believe, is to love God as He ought to be loved. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that is the key to Christian maturity. And we'll find that as we love God more and our love for self and other lovers diminish, that God directs our heart towards His people. And so I'll ask, do you love his bride? Do you love his church? We don't want to diminish any hurt that we felt. Because I think we've all been hurt, and some of us far worse than others. No church is perfect. But where does Christ do his work? Where does the Father, by his Spirit, do, do his work? In his church. Do you love the Lord? Have you received this wisdom by the Spirit? Is Christ your Savior? Do you see him for who he is? The Savior of the world. May we not look at him as a simply as a historical figure. May we look to him as who he says he is. Let's pray together. And as we pray, Jamie, I'll ask you to play something just to uh, turn our minds that way. But would you seek the Lord? Would you seek the Lord? Let's pray.